Heidi Russell Kalkofen. I am the chair of the conference committee, and I'm really excited to have you here. So I would like at this time to present and welcome and ask to come forward the vice president and provost of the Germantown campus, Margaret Latimer. Thank you, Heidi. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to welcome guests and colleagues to the Pinckney Innovation Complex for Science and Technology, PICMC, also known as the Germantown Campus, just in case you didn't really know where you were. Uh, this is the second annual Maryland International Education Day and is one of the original six founding institutions um, of the Maryland International Education Consortium, the college is proud to be hosting this conference on developing globally competent students. On their website, World Savvy defines global competence as the capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. They describe it as the knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behaviors necessary to thrive in today's interconnected world. We've been talking about globalization and the global economy for a long time. We talk about entrepreneurs, the businesses, supply chains, and products. What isn't often talked about, or not talked about enough until now, until today perhaps, are the people and the knowledge and skills that people need to navigate and thrive in our interconnected world, both personally and professionally. There's a worldwide contest for gray matter, in case you hadn't noticed. The contest is played out in the marketing offices of institutions of higher education and in companies large and small around the world. Winners are regions, local, state, and national that attract talent. Winners are individuals and communities that prosper economically and socially that are vibrant places where people find belonging, meaning, and joy. In the UK, they ask, what is the net economic contribution of international students? The net economic uh, impact was estimated to be 68,000 pounds for each typical EU domiciled student, and that was in a 2015-16 cohort, and 95,000 pounds generated by each typical non-EU domiciled student. In other words, every 15 EU students and every 11 non-EU students generate 1 million pounds worth of net economic impact for the UK economy over the duration of their studies. That's net. It's an adjusted figure that counts for the cost of hosting international students. Education is Australia's second largest export industry, behind only mining. Mining mines, I think, is what they're doing is number two. The education of international students in the United States is the United States' sixth largest export, valued at 40 billion annually with 718 million coming to Maryland and almost 70 million of that coming to Montgomery County from MC International students alone. That was recognized 20 years ago by the Department of Commerce and the need to grow that market. So they developed the Study State Initiative. 16 months ago, the MIEC was created. It created a Study State, and there's a website, studymaryland.org, which many of you are probably familiar with, but wanted to provide more than just student recruitment. The overarching mission of MIEC is to, and I quote, serve as a premier advocacy and resource center for the branding and internationalization of MIEC members, public and private higher education institutions in the state of Maryland. In addition to working with Maryland Higher Education Secretary Fielder on policies and Secretary of State Woman Smith regarding sister states and sister city initiatives, MIEC has secured the governor's proclamation of April 26th as Maryland International Education Day. And by the way, Maryland is only one of three U.S. states that has sister, state international, has sister states internationally, almost 20 of them, and Montgomery County is the only U.S. county with sister cities, five of them. MIEC focuses on studying abroad and on professional development, such as this first conference, International education and the development of culturally competent global citizens are so critical to solving today's problems, large and small. You might be ordering in a foreign restaurant, building that better mousetrap, drone delivery for your pizzas, or grand challenges. I'm very proud that Montgomery College is the first, and right now the only community college, 
participating in the National Academy of Engineering's Grand Challenge. Problems that must be met to ensure our future. Things like clean water, aging infrastructure, reducing our vulnerability to assaults in cyberspace, and the development of new medicines are just a few of those. And we talk about wicked problems, those that are dynamic and often hold contradictions, making solutions stubbornly resistant to discovery and implementation. These are problems without boundaries, and they often face cultural barriers. They are being tackled by international teams, teams that must be populated by globally competent members with the knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behavior to work together. It is so fitting that Montgomery College is a part of a consortium that has taken on this work. Our students, staff, and faculty represent the world. The diversity of Montgomery County is a rich resource for us. Just one example, and I'll end with this, on this campus. We have a science lecture series called the Spectrum Lecture, and we have a humanities lecture series called the Athenaeum Symposium. We also have on this campus, and it's part of that PIC MC, that complex, we house the Germantown Innovation Center. Dr. Louis Bronco, who is one of the scientists working in that center, developed the first rapid test for Ebola during the outbreak in West Africa a couple of years ago. He addressed students and colleagues, not as a spectrum speaker, not to discuss the mechanisms of a deadly virus, but he gave one of the Athenaeum addresses to talk about the socioeconomic impact, the impact on people, families, communities, and his colleagues at a clinic in Sierra Leone. We all got a lesson in global competency that day as he talked about the knowledge, attitudes, skills, and behaviors that were necessary to address that deadly outbreak. I've probably talked too long. I told that, uh, that I'd, give just, I'd give just a couple of minutes. Um, so I will end with which, ri wishing you a rich and rewarding day. I know it will be. Um, you are doing important work, not just today, but what all of you will go off and do tomorrow and the tomorrows that have follow that. It's global work. It's important work. Thank you. Steve Hunter is the president of Global Competence Associates, LLC where she works to assess, prepare, and enhance the global workforce of tomorrow. She is a primary author of the Global Competence Aptitude Assessment, which is a diagnostic tool that measures the global readiness of students and working professionals, and then determines areas that would benefit from additional development. She conducts global competence research, training, and certification programs, and she provides consultation to support global competence development across education, business, government, and nonprofit sectors for worldwide clients. Ms. Hunter has been training students and working professionals in global competence and diversity appreciation since 2004. Please welcome Ms. Christy Hunter. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see you all today. And as you can see by my title slide, what is global competence? And why is it so important? And that's what we're going to spend time talking about today. So I do a lot of work with education. And there's a reason for it. I'm actually not an educator. I come from the workforce, kind of the handoff who receives the outputs of education. And working in this space for many years now, I've discovered that maybe not everyone working in education reals, realizes what it's like on the other side. What happens when students go out into the workforce? What is their everyday life like? And being a research organization, we actually measure global readiness skills in students and workers all over the world. So I see the gaps personally. And I want to help. So that's why I'm happy to be here today to talk with all of you. So let me tell you about my first job right out of grad school. I worked for Mars, you know, the candy company. I developed new chocolate products and cookies and snack foods. It was a hard job, but somebody had to do it. <laughs> I'll often ask, did you have to eat that? Yes. <laughs> but I was hired as brand new headcount to the organization. And that's how companies work. They open seats where there is a business need. So as you can imagine, the expectation is that a person's going to perform. There wasn't existing skill in that area in the past, and this is critical to advance the needs of the organization. So my first week on the job, I was expected to call one of our suppliers in Germany 
And I was then supposed to introduce myself to uh, my counterpart working on the Dove chocolate brand in the UK, which any of you are familiar with the UK, it's Galaxy, different chocolate standards there. But he was establishing a new um, manufacturing line in the UAE. So it's really important to harmonize the work that's done around the world when you're working for a global corporation. And it was inevitable that my boss would come to us once a week, maybe several times a month. But in that very first month, I had visitors from a number of countries. And because the area where I was working was so important to advance the needs of the business, we were supposed to share information with our colleagues and counterparts in nations around the world. We called these dog and pony shows because they were just so routine. It might surprise you to realize the year was 1996. I was expected as a student right off campus to work with my colleagues all over the world. This is a challenge. And the one challenge that employers seek or realize is that there is a gap in many cases with the skills that candidates like myself and anyone else existing may have in coming to the workforce. They may not be ready for the job that is required of them. You might hear a lot of people talking about this soft skills. It's making a lot of buzz in media in the recent years. And that's actually how people make hiring decisions, as to have interpersonal skills that an individual might have. And ironically, it's those soft skills that are going to allow an employee to have a long career because their work will not be replaced by machines. So it's really important if you want to have an, a long career that you have these kinds of skills. Now, the Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM, as we like to call ourselves, has done research in this area. And back in 2016, they did a survey amongst hiring managers. And there were numerous opportunities for people to respond to why they did not hire a candidate. 40% of them said it was because communication skills, how they relate to other people. Even 30% of them back then said global competence, and this was several years ago. Notice down the list is technical expertise. It's a possibility, but it's amongst many soft skills. Technical expertise we would call a hard skill versus the relationship skills we call soft skills. But in the field that I had worked on after I worked as a scientist, I was in talent acquisition, a human resource capacity. And the expectation is that the world is your oyster when it comes to hiring. You hire globally. That's just the way it has been for many years now. Because the ultimate goal is to find the best person to advance the needs of the organization, no matter where he or she may reside. It's not a particular geographic locale anymore. And this might surprise you. This study just came out this year from the Harris Poll, and it was supported by Envoy. Here in our own country, surprisingly, 95% of corporations said that they were going to hire, plan to hire foreign workers, and that had some degree of importance in their human resources pipeline strategy, somewhere along the line. About half of those respondents in the survey talked about their need for overseas talent. The vast majority of them, about 80% of them, had said that they actually are using this as part of their talent acquisition strategy. That means they didn't find the work internally in the US to do the job their organizations needed. They're a critical element of their talent pipeline and getting the work done by qualified employees was bringing people from overseas. About 18%, a slim majority by comparison, or slim minority, pardon me, was this rotational assignments only for developing high performers and high potential employees. But that's really not the expectation and what's driving this. So it's important to understand that there's a need for global competence. It's a soft skill, and it's, we need it now more than ever before. Because 
our organizations are becoming even increasingly culturally diverse. So what is global competence? It's important that we're all on the same page. The term was kind of a buzzword in the late 1980s. Actually, from higher ed and some study abroad providers used it first. But then it became more commonplace in the 1990s as a response to globalization. And the reason is past concepts of intercultural, international, what some people might call cultural intelligence as a, as a nickname, if you will, for intercultural competence, and even emotional intelligence, which came into fashion in the 80s and 90s, just didn't meet the needs for a global society and a global marketplace. But we had this term, but still there was an agreement as to what it was. In 1999, my husband embarked on his doctoral dissertation, spent five years investigating this topic because he works at that time and still to this day in higher ed and discovered people were using this term but nobody knew what it was, and there was not agreement as to what it was. A lot of people were spending time internally uh, creating definitions and frameworks. There were about a dozen of them in 1999 that were publicly shared, but none of them were in agreement with one another. And even to this day, some organizations are still trying to define and redefine global competence, and it's just reinventing the wheel and really isn't offering any improvement. But the biggest challenge is how can we address global competence and develop it in our students if it's a moving target? We all have to be on the same page. The most challenging thing of all was that the people defining global competence had done it with internal brainstorming sessions within their geographic frameworks. However, it wasn't global. It wasn't a worldwide perspective as to what global competence was. And that's the reason research globally needed to be done. Anyone familiar with Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? He is a big hero of mine, brilliant man. But I look at my life a lot as the way Stephen Covey does, or did at that time, I should say, in preparing students for their futures. And then we also have to look at existing staff so they can continually grow in their careers. So we have to look comprehensively when we're thinking about this education workforce continuum of global competence. So the research included anything from the past that had been proposed by these groups around the world, as well as assembling a panel of Delphi experts from all over the world across business, government, nonprofit, and education to get consensus, because that's the ultimate goal, to get everyone on the same page. This research was first published in 2004, and we had done some additional research because we've been working in this space for 20 years now. So we've updated our definition just slightly with some more modern language. So global competence, as we have most recently defined with another worldwide Delphi panel technique, is having flexible, respectful attitudes, including self-perspective, and applying knowledge of the historical, geographic, and societal factors that influence cultures in order to effectively interact and build relationships with people around the world. The original research was summarized in the model, and we created this in a typical fashion of human development. So it starts in the core with knowing yourself, and it's kind of like a ripple effect of additional, additional elements of knowledge, capability, and interpersonal skills as a person grows and matures. We're gonna take these areas separately. So the first area is the interior of the model we call internal readiness. And the core of the model is the self-perspective. The darker green layer is attitudes towards other people and other situations. And we'll take a deeper dive into these specific dimensions. So self-awareness is knowing your own personal strengths and weaknesses, as well as how you fit in to the society where you are at this time. 
It doesn't mean you have to agree with those norms and mores, but at least you are aware of any gaps that exist between your preferences and those of the place where you are at this time. Now moving out to the attitudinal areas, risk taking. Any of you supporting study abroad? <laughs> Stretching yourself into areas where you're a little uncomfortable, dipping your toe into that proverbial pool of water. It's really important if you're expecting to grow and learn about cultures around the world, because if you're not willing to step outside your own cultural box, your own comfort zone, it's really hard to build relationships and interact with people from other cultures. So it's a critical aspect. In addition to open-mindedness, now you all probably know what this means, but in addition to that dictionary style definition, we also mean having a curiosity to learn and a desire to take in information from a wide variety of sources. And then after looking at things holistically, arriving at your point of view. Attentiveness to diversity is a two-step process. The first step is having an awareness and being able to perceive differences so instead of that horse with blinders shielding its eyes, we want people to be like a cricket, picking up on subtle clues and cues in its environment with its antennae, able to pick up and discriminate something that's a little different than what I'm expecting. So then once you become aware of difference, then you can proceed to the second step, which is respect. But you can't respect what you're oblivious to. That's why we have two steps. But we mean more than just superficial things like skin tone, which of course is important, but we mean even deeper layers of appreciation and celebrating all those unique, interesting facets that make us all interesting individuals. So we're looking at individuals when we talk about global competence. So now we're proceeding to external readiness. This is a combination of cultural knowledge, which is the light blue ring, and interpersonal skills, which is the dark blue ring. And we'll take a deeper dive into those areas as well. I'm sure you've all seen this before. <laughs> and just to, uh, so you understand how we categorize things, because you're probably familiar with all these things that I'm talking about, but just know how we label them and put them into different buckets. So the visible aspects of culture, we refer to as global awareness. And our premise is, the five senses. So if I'm traveling to a new culture, a new country, what should I expect to encounter there? What could I pick up and notice with my five senses? So you see, I am be aware, I can see symbols of different religions and flags and buildings and so forth, language, cuisine, arts and architecture, geography, native dress, all those kinds of things. But then, of course, you all know, <laughs> the deeper part of culture is the part that we can't see. And this is so important because this is what's driving culture. We get at culture at the foundational level. What was that pivotal event, era, period of time that transformed the society and shaped the values and the beliefs and the cultural sensitivities that exist with the people in that place today. Things that could have been in the modern day, maybe a decade ago, or maybe a millennia ago, way, way back, but they keep teaching their citizenry about this major event because they don't want to repeat it. They're especially proud of it, or maybe they want to have some caution to their citizens. So these are the foundational elements that drive culture, is the stories that get passed down. So now we're getting at the interpersonal skills, that outermost ring of the model. We call the intercultural competence element of adjusting your approach to treat people the way they want to be treated, intercultural capability simply because having a, an intercultural competence label within another model, a label of, of competence, global competence, doesn't make much sense to some people. But if you know intercultural competence, this is the, the ability to adjust your approach one on one to make people comfortable and build rapport. Now the teamwork dimension 
is your ability to work with a diverse group of people. So regardless of the diversity on your team, are you able to find ways to work effectively together? So one dominant culture isn't steamrolling other cultures, and the minority voice gets lifted up, and you value all the inputs and views of those people on your team, adjusting for different expectations of time and deadline and personal space and communication style, all those things that you folks are familiar with. But this is especially important in the workforce, because for any of you who are familiar with the statistics, most diverse teams have great potential to succeed. But the, the statistics are the opposite. Most diverse teams fail because people don't know how to use their diversity as an asset. Instead, it becomes an impediment to their success. So these are critical aspects of skills, knowledge, and attitudes necessary to work in the workforce. So any of you ever seen this model? The Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, as I mentioned before, they also have a competency model. By the way, the concept of a competency is a human resources construct from the 1930s. So we're borrowing language from human resources, so they, they kind of know what they're talking about. But they have a competency that they call global and cultural effectiveness. And basically, that's global competence. I'm a SHRM member, have been for many years because of the work that I do. So everything that they did independently of our research in a different decade by different people, different strategy, validated everything that we did uh, even earlier. We just called them different things and they're in slightly different buckets, but just be aware that this is very real world and practical. So there's no such thing as competencies, global competencies, because to be globally competent means you need all of them. Right? You can't just pick and choose and call open-mindedness a competency because it isn't. That's not what a competency means. So we need all of these things to truly be effective. Now, just to bring you along with this, to tell you things you probably already know, but in case a couple of you are thinking differently, we're changing our paradigm a little bit here. We're leaving the scope of international and moving to global. So to satisfy international, we're, we don't looking for just an expert in a particular area. To be a globally competent individual means that you're a generalist, that I, work, I can work with any culture. Remember my first month on the job? <laughs> That's the reality of the workforce. So the goal is that someone can survive, and not just survive, but thrive in any place that they might work, not knowing in advance where they might land who they might interact with, a globally competent person can work with anyone in the world. So, but you need all three legs of this stool, which makes this a slightly different approach than models in the past. You actually have to have the knowledge of cultures around the entire world, because without it, you might have a missing or broken leg, and everyone who sat in a three-legged stool knows what happens if you're missing a leg, you fall off. Very embarrassed. <laughs> And that's actually the, the most common aspect of embarrassment is the lack of knowledge in cultures around the world. So those of you who might be familiar with our friends who you're receiving from, K through 12, they've been talking about global competence for more than a decade. And they put global competence on this bottom row. I like to think of competencies as bricks in a wall. Because when I was in talent acquisition, it was a matter of mixing and matching which bricks were part of a job description or part of a resume. So it, these are just example bricks, but as you can grow in a person's career, they keep adding more competencies and different layers as they grow up the ranks until eventually become in the senior suite and more layers of capability. So again, this is a 21st century approach. This is the expectation of the modern day is breadth of knowledge. While we all have expertise, that's great. That's fabulous. But that's not enough in the modern economy. So we need to go beyond that. So just to help make sense of this, there's so many terms. I get this all the time, people coming to me, I'm so confused. I'm trying to figure out what this one means and what that one means. And for the most part, because we're in a totally different space now, 
a lot of these terms are much more similar to one another. Global competence is like an orange to the apple. They're just in a different construct. So global competence is part of these other concepts. Intercultural competence is part of global competence. To be globally competent means that you ha are interculturally competent. If you've ever heard the term global citizenship, that requires additional capabilities, those humanitarian aspects to do good for the country, to do good for the world, the people inhabit, it, inhabit the planet. But to be effective and to solve some of those major world issues, we need to be globally competent work first before we can solve HIV AIDS and deforestation and climate change and human trafficking. We have to be globally competent before we can go in the field and help those people. So, where we are now is thinking broadly. We need to develop students who have the capability to go anywhere. They're ready now. That's the reality that they're going to face. Former Secretary of Education Arne Duncan was very um, insightful a number of years ago. I don't know if any of you have caught this quote from him. But in the past, we talked about educating for our state, educating for our nation, but that's just not how it works anymore. Companies in our country are bringing in international students or, or workers from other nations, like I had said previously. So the ultimate goal that I have is to help build bridges. So we're all on the same page that we can cross these straits. These don't have to be two separate worlds, two separate continents. We can be talking to one another and thinking downstream. And you folks in higher ed have this unique perspective because you are receiving the outputs of K through 12 and you also handing off to the workforce. So this is a really valuable and a critical role that you folks play in this whole scheme. Because truly, global competence takes a lifetime to develop. It does not happen overnight. It takes many, many years building knowledge, developing interpersonal skills, which comes with maturity and opening minds. So basically, that is what I had to share with you today. And I hope that this gives you a little bit more perspective as you consider the rest of the conference.